that's so cool. It's almost identical. H A N A N H A N A S. Like duh, that was a no brainer for a title. But then I found out that the two of them have something uniquely in common that no one else has. No one else from our great enemies. And we have a lot of enemies. We've had a lot of enemies all the way from Mitzrayim all the way till today. We've gone through a lot. But those two have something unique and special. And uh, God willing, I'm going to explore this with you. This is the first time I'm giving this class publicly. And I'm not even sure what I'm telling is the truth. I'm not even sure that it's MS. Um, be, feel free to question and to criticize. And as Hashem is Baruch Hashem should give me koach that I should say Teres MS tonight. So let's go. My story begins in Poland. I, if you do not know, I moonlight as a European um, travel guide. And basically, as I'm sure you're aware, there's two parts to Europe, what I call happy Europe and sad Europe. Um, happy Europe is where I would love to take you as a Kahila. Um, young Israel of Hollywood, let's go to Italy, let's go to Spain, okay, let's party. But then there's, of course, um, the sad Europe, which is basically Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania. And these places, I don't like visiting them, but they are extremely powerful. And uh, I, I succeed, Baruch Hashem, I hope to continue doing this. I'm going to be there this, this time next month. I succeed in doing in Poland what takes me weeks and weeks of teaching in the Holy Land of Israel, just because of the gravity and the power of what went on, what went on there. But Poland also has places that are incredibly inspiring. And for me, the number one place, literally in the whole of Europe, is a place called Lizhensk. Um, in Lizhensk is buried the Heilige, the Rebbe of Meilich of Lizhensk. Um, he is, in a sense, after the Baal Shem Tov and after the the uh, 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 the, the Berm from Mezerich, he is he is the third great Hasidic master. Again, Chabad and Breslov have their own past. The Ukrainian Hasidus had their own past, but almost every other Hasidus go back to the Rebbe of Melech, and um, it's a holy place. The Kleisenberger Rebbe said that all of Poland is dead. The only place that is alive is the burial place of the Kleisenberger Rebbe, of the, of the, of the Rebbe of Melech. So I have a little bit of Hasidic blood me, so just bear with me. Whenever I go to a holy place, I do like mikvah vibes. Whenever I can't, I go to the mikvah before and I feel holy, I'm ready to go see the big tzaddik. And I was with a group, uh, a bunch of men from the Lakewood area, Tom River, Jackson, some of you may have heard of these places, an incredible group. And we went there and I told them, I'm going to make well, who wants to come with me? Which thank God some of them did, which was a good thing. Because something happened in that mikvah. I'm not exactly sure what, but I slipped on something and I woke up in a hospital in Lezhensk. This is exactly two and a half years ago. May 28th, 2021 is when it happens. I woke up, I'm calling it a hospital because I'm being nice. Uh, it's more like a scene from a horror movie, uh, you know, I want to suck your blood. <laughs> like, this is Dracula's castle. You don't actually see patients, you just hear the moans and the groans in the distance and all these terrifying looking doctors that are walking around. And this was at the very end of Corona. Now this is Miami, so I know you guys did not have Corona, right? You didn't have Corona, but Poland, they did not allow anybody in except for my Polish driver. His name was Wojtek. I have no idea how you really write it, but V-O-Y-T-E-K, Wojtek is going to be an important player in my story. So Wojtek is like a classic Russian taxi driver in Brooklyn. No, I speak English very good, yeah. But he did not know what I was trying to communicate. I was trying to communicate that from here, beyond... I had zero knowledge that it existed. Now, you can try this right now. Close your eyes and see if you can touch your nose. Go on, try it. <laughs> I don't know, I love it when you see people do it. It's, you will look so ridiculous just now. <laughs> but the reason why I'm trying to show this to you is that really it's part of Hashem's miracles that our brain can tell our finger where our nose is. It's just incredible. I had no idea what was going from here onwards. Um, what I could show you, but I'm not going to do it now, I have actually... A picture of the x-ray of my, for some bizarre reason, is called a humerus. There's nothing funny about this at all. But like from here to here, imagine a salami 
imagine cutting it all the way this way and then cutting it one, two, three, that way. And that's what my arm looked like. Um, my hand was the size of a football. I had roaring pain going through my arm, but uh, thank God they gave me, which was the only good part of the story, they gave me what I call happy medicine. I felt like a teenager again. And <laughs> sorry, Basi, don't listen. Okay, but the point is, is that, is that it, it was it was excruciating being painful, and I didn't even know, had no feelings whatsoever was going on. To this very day, I still have a bone sticking out. My grandkids like to touch and go, oh, that's disgusting. Um, for reasons that I'm not going to tell because it's not relevant to my story, that bone that sticks out is called the Reb Chaim Kinyaski bone. You should show me a picture of Reb Chaim Kinyaski. He told me to get it operated on for reasons that I will not discuss now. Um, I did not, and that's why it's still sticking out. Um, I did not listen to him, and the last time I met him, I said to him, I can't listen to you because whatever, bottom line, I was too afraid. The doctor said this is an extremely delicate, complicated operation. I asked him for a bracha not to listen to him. He gave me a bracha, and and, and <laughs> yeah, I'm strange that way. <laughs> and um, Baruch Hashem, I'm here, as you can see, with full arm movement, still hurts. It's, still, it's always going to hurt for the rest of my life. But Bar Hashem, I'm basically healed, stronger, more powerful than ever before. Let's go back to my story. I'm in this hospital, and Wojtek is communicating to me what the doctors are discussing. And basically, the conversation went like this. We must put nails in this man's bones. We must put nails right now. This is Lijensk. In Lijensk, we have no nails. I have a friend, Boris. He is carpenter. Maybe he have nails. <laughs> now, I said, okay, okay, okay. There's only so far you can go with a horror movie. <laughs> luckily, luckily, there was a very kind nurse who had this very modern technology called WhatsApp. And I asked to borrow it, and I put in the WhatsApp of a friend of mine called Dr. Michael Wilshansky, who is a phenomenal surgeon in Hadassah Hospital. We are childhood friends. We literally grew up together. My wife was not available. She was on a plane to Baltimore to visit her father. So I call up Willie. That's what I call him, Michael Wyshansky. I call him up, and he, he was actually in a pub, in a bar in central Yerushalayim, England, was in the quarterfinals of the soccer Euros. I, I don't know anyone over here know that language. And uh, whatever it is, England just go, you go, Harry Kane, yeah, get England, England. I said, I said, Willie, walk out of that. I hope you're not drunk. This is your best friend. We went to kindergarten together, and I am in a hospital in southern Poland, in Galicia, in a shtetl called Lizhensk, and my hand is the size of a football. So he says to me, he suddenly gets very serious. He says to me, Menachem, he calls me man, he says, Menachem, Get out of that hospital. I said, one second, just like run out of that. Yeah, escape. <laughs> escape from the hospital. Get into your taxi, go straight to Warsaw Airport, get on a plane. And the moment that you land in Ben Gurion, I will take care of you, which he did. And I had a whole series of miracles once I landed in the country. Now, I turned to Wojtek, I said, okay, we're escaping. What do you mean escaping? I said, did you ever seen like, any of the Bourne movies? <laughs> okay, so this was really more like a comedy than an action thriller. And the two of us ran out of there. We ran into his car. We ran to the place, the Lezhensk, where my friends were waiting. Dove Kurland jumped in with us. <clears throat> and the three of us are off on a five-hour all-night journey to Warsaw Airport. Suddenly, I notice that Wojtek is actually falling asleep on the wheel. And now I have a whole new set of problems. I say, Wojtek, get off right now. Get off the road, go and find a place to rest and then take us to the airport. It's gonna be okay. He says, thank you, Rabbi, thank you. He goes off, he veers off. Minutes later, we are inside a Polish forest. He switches off the engine the lights are off. Seconds later, he is snoring. And Dove is snoring. And now my problems are real because they are snoring in harmony. <laughs>
I don't know how it works out, but somehow or other, Dove had like the low par, and Voitok had some kind of like a nasal situation, like King David's harp, but not really heart strings. It was more like nose hairs. And 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 this whole thing was like, oh my gosh. Okay, I don't know what Gehenna is like, but this has got to be it. And I start to breathe in the situation. The fun medicine has now disappeared. The waves of pain are back in full force. And I do not realize how painful pain can be. I don't think in my life I ever experienced pain. My wife said, it's about time, <laughs> okay? I gave birth to nine, nine of our kids, you know? It's about time that you felt it. And, and <laughs> hands, the size of a football, and then suddenly it starts to sink in what I can no longer do. Now, I don't wanna get into the gory details, but let's start off with personal hygiene. Think about chas v'shalom, the things that we cannot do if we only have one hand. Now, I have to be sensitive over here because I don't know who's in the audience. But for me, I'm super active man. I always like to be take care of myself wherever I can. Suddenly, I am plunged into a situation where for the next three months, one of my sons had to take care of whatever, taking a shower and stuff like that. Next three months, I would not be able to sleep in a bed. For the next three months, I couldn't put my clothes on. For the next three months, I suddenly was plunged into a world hitherto unknown to me, where I am dependent on people for every small, teeny, wee little thing. In that forest, I don't even know that I'm ever going to get better. As far as I'm concerned, that's it. I now have one hand. My life has come to an end. Now, you know, when you start to get scared, so then you imagine things, and outside <laughs> the car, I'm hearing wolves. And then I remembered that this is a Polish forest, so there must be bears as well. And <laughs> I suddenly am turning to Hashem for the first time in my life, and remember that I'm a tefillah teacher. A lot of you learn tefillah from me. Yeah, we just came out with a new version of Rick Shilev, and... Um, Anyone that ever saw the article Sitter for Women. So you'll see that the author thanks me in the introduction because it's based on my Sefer Rick Shilev. So I always thought that I'm a Tzvila expert. I always thought that I was a Davener. Never in my life, not even Yom Kippur, at the climax of Yom Kippur, did I feel so completely dependent on Hashem's mercy like I did in that forest in Poland. Completely and totally, Hashem, I'm in your hands. This was Enod Levado on a totally different level from Menachem Nissel. I'm not going to lie to you, I was very frightened. But my tefillah was real. And I asked the Kush Bar, Kush Bar Hu, I just want to, I want to do your work over here. I want to be able to do what I'm doing right now. I want to be able to teach Torah to your kindle, Saint Kachin, to bring them back to you. I want to be able to hold a grandchild, to hold a safer, for goodness sake. I didn't think I was ever going to hold a safer again. It took me four or five months before I could put on tefillin. My friends took turns to wrap up my tefillin. But those tefillas were very real. And I know that those tefillas had to be because I, then I woke up Wojtek and I said to Wojtek the following words. I said to us, Take us to the airport. How far are we from the airport? You know what he said? Five minutes. <laughs> we were literally five minutes away from the airport. Now, this is every Polish joke you heard is true. Because he could have just taken us to the airport. No, he goes into the forest with the bears and the wolves so I could have that feel a moment. It's like insane. This is insane. Now, why am I telling you this? Chapter one of Rick Shilev, which you should all get, not that I'm plugging my safer. And while you're at it, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel right here. But <laughs> to be honest with you, to be honest with you, chapter one is called A Woman's Obligation to Pray. And it begins with the classic machlokas between the Rambam, Maimonides, and the Ramban, Nachmanides. I'm simplifying where the tefillah is from the Torah or tefillah is from the rabbis. If you want, you can call it man in search of God, God in search of man, as the people say it that way. 
the way to remember it is the Ramban Nachmanides says it's the Rabbanon. That's how you remember. The Raman says it's the Raisa. For the ladies over here, I bring down a whole list of halachic nafkimenes, halachic differences that come out about the two sides. If you hold this to Raisa, if you hold this from the Torah, then the Rambam says to fulfill your mitzvah, all you have to do is any shevach, bakasha, huda, dear God, I think you're awesome. Help me make it through the day without strangling my kids. And yeshkayach, and that's it. That's all you need to do. If you hold this to Rabbanon, then women are obligated to daven, says the Mishnah Burah. Shachris, Mincha, 19 blessings, Pesukah Zimmer to introduce it. All those laws kick in if we pass them like the Ramban, and that's how we pass them. But now comes my point. There is another form of tefillah called tefillah be'es tzara, tefillah be'et tzara, which means tefillah in times of pain, meaning when you find yourself in life where suddenly you are vulnerable like Menachem Nisso in a Polish forest. At that moment, everyone holds that your tefillos are doraisa, but tzara lecha on when things are terrifying and difficult for you, and you feel that moment, you turn yourself over to Hashem. I just want to say it um, in the style of the Maharal, if I can. You all know that the Merkava, the heavenly chariots, has got four legs. Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, David and Melech, the fourth one, right? I'm simplifying. Any Sephardic sisters over here? Okay, so this is for you. My children in kindergarten, had this beautiful coloring thing where you have Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Out of the second letters was the following. Abraham, from the bed came Boker and a sunrise. Yitzchak, from the tzadi, was Tzaharayim and the sunset. Yaakov, and this is why I only works with Spartan, because we say Marev, out of it, and you see the night. And the Maral goes into great detail, which is not today's class, how each one of the three Avos each one of them owned that part of the day. Lahagid baboker chasdecha. It's Avma Bina's time. The sun is setting. You need Gvura to deal with your challenges. Nighttime belongs to Yaakov Avinu, the Ish Emes. So each one of the three took a different part of the 24 hour clock. David and Melech, that's Sila Be'esara. That's Tehillim. And that is why everywhere across the globe, everywhere across the globe, Today, there's been a surge in Tehillim. My wife is the busiest woman I know, and she joined the Tehillim group um, since the war began. I'm sure that's happening here. I'm sure it's happening everywhere. We're rediscovering the powerful words of David HaMelech. Now, I didn't come over here to tell you things that you know. I'm going to come over here and tell you things that I'm hoping is new for you, but it's going to be a little bit scary. Put on your safety belts, okay? Put up your tray tables into the upright and locked positions because we are going on a ride. Now, beginning with a story that you all know. A long, long time ago, in a faraway land where knights were bold and ogres lived in swamps, there was a beautiful, beautiful princess. True story. This beautiful princess was the most beautiful woman in the whole land. Every woman was jealous or adored her and followed whatever she did. She would change her hairstyle, so would everybody else. She was the it woman. She was famous for being famous. She had her own fashion lines. She had her own store on Rodeo Drive. She even had her own reality show, Keeping Up with the Kamenetskis. And everything about it was just like, that was it. She was the special woman. Every prince dreamed about having her hand in, in marriage. One day, this beautiful princess goes to her father, who is literally the most powerful man in the world. He comes in and he says, Father, we need to talk. And Paro, the king of Egypt, looks at his daughter and says, yes, my dear daughter, how can I help you? Anything you want. Father, I'm not content. Ha! I'm the most powerful man in the world. You can do what you want. I can do a line of perfume named after you. You want to travel through Europe? You can count on me. I can do whatever you want. No, no, no. Father, I am seeking 
spirituality. I need more. I need the real thing. I need Ruchnias. At that point then, Paro starts to shiver. He asks everyone to leave the room and he's alone with his daughter. He looks her in her eyes and says, do you know who you're talking to? I'm Paro. I'm the lowest of the lowest. I'm the most degraded person on the planet. Years later, Yermio Navi is going to call me Ervasaaretz. Everything that is lowly is defined by Egypt. Do you want me to help with spirituality? But I'm going to tell you a secret. Sometime back, a woman came into my palace. She was brought to me. Honestly, Hagar, you're beautiful. But honestly, every woman in history is like a monkey compared to her beauty. This is a quote from Chazal, what I'm telling you now. But here's my problem. I would look at her beauty and instantly I would have elevated thoughts. Oh my gosh, I felt so uncomfortable. Her beauty raised me to a spiritual level. Her beauty made me think of God and I felt so uncomfortable. And thank God she left. It was a whole scene. And she went back to the land of Canaan and she's there now. And if you want to find spiritually, you have to go and find her. The next day, Hagar, the daughter of Pharaoh, disappears. This is the biggest scandal since Where's Waldo? The paparazzi are going insane. No one knows where she is. In another country, the future land of Israel, in a seminary called with no sorrow, there's a knock on the door. Sorry, Menu opens it, says, who are you? I, <laughs> I am Hagar, princess of Egypt. Come on, it's not perm yet, okay? No, I am. He says, what are you doing over here? He says, I want to join your seminary. What are you, crazy? You can't come to my seminary. Maybe Neve. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry, Menu, but Neve is not going to be invented for another 4,000 years. <laughs> You're the only seminary in town. Can you give me a trial? Just maybe for a month? Now, anyone in education knows that we all love a challenge. The ceremony says, okay, come on, let's do this. She gets to Chavrusa, I don't know, with Eliezer's daughter. And before we know it, she is now number one. Numero uno, top of the set. She's doing so well, she's flying. Now, the next segment of my presentation, it's unfair to say it without giving a proper explanation, but it's so off topic. So I'm just gonna say it in a remise. Sorry, Maynard comes along and says, my dear Hago, you're amazing. You are incredible. I wanna reward you by making you marry my husband, Avram Avina. It's called a pelegish. I don't even like to say the English word, it's so awkward. But just to give you a sense of where this could be going, Hagar was given the opportunity to become what later Bilha and Zilpah, the half-sisters of Roch and Leah, would eventually become the mother of Shvatim of Klai Yisrael. Hagar could have been that woman. She got pregnant instantly, almost instantly. First baby, whatever. We're not going to talk about that now. But she got pregnant and she starts to think, you know, maybe I'm so amazing. That I'm even better than my own mentor. Sarah picks up on the vibe, sees what's going on, and Sarah makes a very, very harsh chinuch decision that had to be. That had to be. The only way Hagar is going to learn a lesson is she is cut off from the source of her spiritual nourishment. The next day, poor Hagar goes down in history as the first woman ever to be kicked out of a sem. <laughs> now, I live in Yerushalayim. A lot of you studied over there. You all know what happens when you're kicked out of sem. The Pasuk says she ended up in the Midbar. So you and I think of a Midbar, we think of, I don't know, the Negev. No, there's another way of looking at Midbar. In Yerushalayim, we call it Crack Square. <laughs> Unfortunately, right near the entrance to the old city, there's a place. You're a nobody if your grandfather's not a Rosh Hashiva and there's literally needles on the floor and broken alcohol bottles. This is all the rejects. 
and all the low lights. I don't want to call them low lights because in my opinion, they're all beautiful in the shamas. They're wonderful people. The things went wrong for them. It's got nothing to do with my class. But whenever the kid gets, gets kicked out, I always try my best to reach out to her or to him and to tell him, you're a good person. You made a mistake, but you're a good person. Don't allow your mistakes to define you. And I tell their friends to reach out to them to make sure to catch them before they crash and end up in the midbar. There was no one for Hagar to catch her. She's in the midbar. She is completely on her own. She has fallen to the bottom of the bottom. And she does something that is earth shattering. She does something that is the first time in history that anything like this is read, written in the Torah. She does something that you and I are suffering deeply for this very moment for what she did. She prayed. She dove into our Kurdish Baruch Hu. And then like in country music, I saw an angel from heaven. Suddenly out of nowhere, angels appeared. One, two, three. They start telling her things. You're going to have a child. His name is going to be Yishmael. God listens to your prayers. Yishmael, listen to that name. Oimi Yishmael is Sumakel, says Rabbein Ibn. Woe to us, to the one that has the power of prayer, that has the word kale in their name. She turns around and she sees a bear. And she goes, well, well, well. Sorry about that. Anyhow, she sees, okay, some of you may know that reference. Okay, and that well, according to, she calls it Be'er Lechai Roy, a well to a living God who looks after me. But according to our tradition, that well eventually transmogifies into the Be'er Miriam that nourishes the Jewish people for 40 years. The Be'er Miriam that created an infinity of miracles. And according to our tradition, the Be'er Miriam ends up in the Kinera, and the Arizal gave to his Talmud, Reb Chaim Vital, to drink from it, has its origins in hunger and her tefillahs. Now we understand why we are living in such difficult times. Reb Chaim Vital, I'm going to read it to you right now. And this is going to be my connection to Homo. Reb Chaim Vital, Read a pasuk in Tehillim, Parakuf Kafdalat. At the very beginning, it says the following: Shir Hamalas, Ledavid. The David Amalek is singing a song of ascents. Lule Hashem Shehayelanu Yemen Yisrael. I'm giving it a rough translation. Kadosh Baruch Hu, be there for us when we're b'tzaras. Be there for us in times of trouble. But there's another pasuk: Lule Hashem Shehayelanu Bekom Aleinu Adam. But we're going to need special help from you when our enemy is called an Adam. And right over here in the story of Hagar, the Malach says, para Adam. This Adam is a reference to Yishmael. Full disclosure, in the Gemara Megillah, Adam is a reference to Homon, but we're going to get there in about 10 minutes. Let's first stick with what's happening over here. Comes along Rav Chaim Vital in his Sefer Deret Chaim and says, you should know the Jewish people will suffer from full Goliaths. Nations compared to animals, but there's one enemy, the fifth one. The fifth one literally means the climax of the fourth Goliath of Edom. And he says two words. And I'll never forget this because my rabbi, Rabbi Moshe Shapiro, good willing, I'm going to get some of you his, his I just wrote a safer of uh, his biography with 24 essays of his Torah. Rabbi Moshe Shapiro, my rabbi, when he read this to us, I was maybe in my late 20s when I heard this the first time from him. And I'll never forget because it made an impression. When he said the next two words, he was literally trembling. My rabbi was trembling. There's going to be a fifth Gaulus at the end of days. Vakasha Mikulam. It's going to be harder than any other Gauls. Now, this is my own interjection. We're not talking about the amount of people being killed. I am Paskaning. That's, that's what it's referring to. Because Ishmael 
at the end of the day, it's not a self. I don't want to say horrible things, but I'm going to say it anyhow because I want to make a point. Everything that happened in Simcha Sarah, what they call October 7th, everything that's happened to every soldier that died of Kiddush Hashem fighting for our country, every Jew that ever died because they're Jewish across the globe since 1945, since the Holocaust, you add them all up, you look at the numbers, it's basically between one and two weeks of Hungarian transports in 1944. It's not rocket science. They had between eight and 12 transports a day. Some of them were carrying a thousand people. And they were all died of Kir Shashem in Auschwitz. And from Aramid Bells said that when we talk about the terrible, terrible things at the end of days before Mashiach comes, that's behind us. That's the Holocaust. So what does it mean, Vakasha Mikulam? Says my Rebbe, because this creature called Yeshua who the terror calls an Adam, he plays dirty. He plays in our turf. He's not like Esau. Esau is your dying day Esau. Esau has gas chambers. Esau has inquisitions. Esau has crusades. Esau has Roman gladiators. But Yishmael has nothing. Yishmael is weak. Yishmael is, what did it take to bring down the Twin Towers? A bunch of guys running around in flip-flops, in Afghanistan, I remember when Osama bin Laden said, it wasn't us. And Ramesh Shapiro says, now he's telling the truth. You think it was you? No. It was completely a Kurdish Baruch To bring down America with a bunch of ragtag, whatever it was, it's a Kurdish Baruch Because they have, in a bizarre sense, a schus called the schus of tefillah, the merit of prayer, I don't believe that when we say they have the merit of prayer, it means that, you know, I'm davening to be able to murder a Jew that Hashem listens. But it means in general, Yishmael. Yishmael means that when you see a Muslim bowing down five times a day, Rabbi Shua Leib Diskin, the Rav of Yerushalayim 100 years ago, would not walk in front of them because he held, it had the category of a Shmon Asra. Can you imagine? They're diving to Allah and they're passionate about Allah and it's all they talk about. Kashimi Kulam means that we're living in a period of history where everything is topsy-turvy. Now, I'm trying not to say negative things about our own people, but I'm just going to quote to you my Rebbe. He said this privately. I'm just going to repeat it. He says, Eile Berecha, the Eile Besusen, the Anach Nibashem Hashem Alakim Nizkera. They go with their chariots, they go with their horses, we fight in the name of God. My Rebbe said with tears in his eye, woe to us if we go with our powerful nation, with our armies, and they go with the name of God. It's changing, everything's changing now. But I remember the first few days of the war, oh, bless their souls, they should be well and healthy. They came out with the name of the war called, I know, the Iron iron Sword, something like that, right? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, Stalin would be so proud of that. And they, our enemies, called it the Al-Aqsa War. I said, this is completely not normal. This is completely not normal. It's all changing in Israel. It's all changing. Baruch Hashem, should continue to change. I'm going to get to that in a moment. I'm going to get to that in a moment. But something is not normal over here. Because, again, Let's look at it from a secular viewpoint, because I'm going to get immediately back to our narrative. From a secular viewpoint, Israel is a top 10 army. You ask any, ask, uh, go and ask the, the army, the, the, the military experts. They have, I don't know, 30,000 soldiers without arms, without real tanks, without planes, without anything. They, what they did to us was a humiliation with hand gliders and tractors. And after the atrocities they committed, what happened? So anyone with a brain, which is now every day more and more Jews across the globe, they realize something. They understand that Israel, when Hashem says yes, can destroy three mighty armies in six days in 1967. When Hashem says no, so we're totally dependent on Hashem. Because Baruch is setting this up to a world that is kashem ikulam. 
This is a really, really dangerous army because the war that is going on is on two fronts. What I call the external front and the internal front. And the inter external front is real. It's another thing that I personally notice. I don't know why it bothers me so much because Baruch makes it that almost every single day and it should, it should end today, one or two of our soldiers die al Kiddush Hashem. It's not like, you know, 20 and then no one for two weeks. Every day, one or two, one or two. I was just now in LA in a shul two months ago. And the Rav said to me, what am I going to do about Tehillim? People don't say Tehillim with Kavon anymore. That's what he said to me. He said to me, you know, like it's a little bit, uh, I'm actually very impressed. I just said it. I just with Davin now in Sharit Tefila. They said Tehillim the way it's supposed to be. That was uh, two days ago in the Aguda in Baltimore. They said to him, this is Baruch Hashem, Kalah Yisrael is doing well. But he was worried about his congregation. They're saying it, taking off the tefill and running out. I said, I'm going to give you a suggestion and you're not going to do it because it doesn't make sense. What you should do is before you say to him, just read the names of what happened in the last 24 hours since yesterday morning of who died and any information you know about them. And then say the following words, our tefillos, can direct the bullets. Every bullet has an address. Every bullet has a place where it's supposed to go or a place where it's not supposed to go. So our bullets should hit their mark and their bullets should miss. Who learned in Darchibina? Anyone over here? Okay, there we go. Karen Thaler, Rebison Thaler. It's a son. I don't remember the exact number, but I think he was blown up. 30 pieces of shrapnel went into his body. Nebuch, the person that took him out of the wreckage, he was murdered. The doctor said they've never seen anything like it. 30 pieces all over his body, not a single one touched a vital organ. Millimeters, millimeters. Where does that come from? Where does the nasek that come from? It'll take him months and months of rehab. But everything is in functioning order. There's tiny millimeters of difference. Is our tefillos. So we are also frontline fighters. And we're fighting a dangerous enemy because their koch is tefillah. And the only way we can defeat them is that our tefillah should be more powerful for them. Now I want to connect this. Now I'm going to connect it in a moment to, to Haman. Let me say two major final points. My first major final point is to continue the thought that I'm just saying to you. My biggest fear, and I'm talking to myself, don't think I'm giving you Musa because I just came from here. I'm talking to myself. My biggest fear is, 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 is burnout. You know, enough already, okay? Where are we going for Pesach? Which Pesach program? Summer holidays? This is what happens. Yeah, the kitchen needs to be redone. No, no, no. Actually, if you really look carefully what's going on, it's actually getting worse. And I, I don't mean to be scary, but I want to scare you a little bit. I want to scare myself. Because it's not just a war going on in Gaza. I am Leonara, 62 years old. I'm old enough to remember the Yom Kippur War. That's the last time I remember seeing my father's face, how frightened he was at that time then. But honestly, what is going on is insane because it's not just, it's the whole world has suddenly become, it's okay to be anti-Semitic. For the youth, it's actually cool. And it's like, it's almost bizarre to the point of being funny. I remember the state of Africa decided to accuse us of genocide. And I was telling my wife, I says, do they know that every single day in South Africa, there's 500 murders? This is what we're talking about. And then out of nowhere, like Brazil, since when do they have beef with us? Yeah, okay, we're a bunch of Nazis. Last week it was Colombia. Okay, I'm, I'm happy that they've gone past their cartels, that they can now accuse us as being Nazis. Iceland, I don't know how Iceland knows about Jews, but somehow they managed that 10% of their population made a, a, a petition. <laughs> I know this sounds ridiculous, but still, where does it come from? That if Israel is allowed to go into the Eurovision Song Contest, we're pulling out. We don't want to be on the same stage as those murderers, as they already, I don't know how many at this point now, the Hamas health ministry is probably accused of as killing, I don't know, 100 
million Palestinian children. Whatever it is that they're saying, okay? Whatever it is. Thank God for the BBC. I'm British. I'm allowed to say this. The BBC's job is to validate everything that the Hamas health ministry says. It actually is a chazal. Before Mashiach comes, there's going to be tension between Ace and Mishmael, but there's also going to be a partnership. I'm British, so I know how the BBC thinks. I understand their vibe. The genius of the BBC is for every nine anti-Semitic articles, they say something that's extremely pro-Israel. So now everything else is fine. And they can have, you know, oh, let's find some starving poor Palestinian children and make that the headline so that in England, where I grew up, there's anti-Semitism in a level that I've not seen my whole life. And all my students on American campuses, they're afraid to go around with their mug and dovies around their necks. It's not going to get better. How's it going to get better? Because Israel is going to suddenly win the war. And everyone's going to make peace and live happily ever after. How does that make sense? I'm not a politician. I just got a brain. Israel knows, has no idea how to end this. Let's see, we kill every single Hamas member. So tomorrow it's going to be Hezbollah. They have guided missiles. That I don't want to say, I'll tift the or something. And then get Hezbollah. The day after that, it could be Syria. And the day after that, Shemi Rachman could be Iran. How, much, how do you want, how much can we do? What can we, what can we possibly do? How can we fight such a thing? If there's 1.1 billion Muslims, all you need is 10%, which is what I was told in the statistic, that would rather die if they can kill a Jew. 10% are radical Muslims. So that is 100 million Muslims that want you and I dead. So who's going to protect us? Who is going to protect us? Who has the plan? Slowly but surely, and this is, I'm davening, and this is what I want to get to. I want every single one of you to have three tools, actually a fourth tool. The first tool you should have is to daven for yourselves, daven for your own personal pain. But those of you that are my students, so I always tell the end of Shimon Astray, before you take three steps back, think about your own personal pain. Anyone in this in front of me that's going through real pain, so you are a commando fighter in our army. Because if you understand your personal pain, if you could have your Menachem Nissel in a Polish forest moment, so then you really understand the pain of your nation. But once you've done for your shalom bias and for your children and for your friends that are sick and your, all the other things that are on your mind, turn to Hashem and ask him for three things. Number one is our soldiers. They're not somebody else's kids. They're our kids. In my case, it's my sister's children, my friends, my chavrus's children. These are our people. These are our boys that are putting their lives in danger so that I can sleep at night and you can sleep at night. You have to tell them that Kishbal who should give them that, their, that every bullet from then should miss and every one of our bullets should hit their mark, the mark, their mark. Number one. Secondly, Daven for Kla Yisrael. Daven for my sister that can't sleep at night because she's worried about her kids and all the other mothers and the children that, that, that are going through. I live in Aronoff. All these people, it seems like half of Steyrot has moved in. Everywhere you go in Israel, there's refugees. Refugees like after world, everywhere. Now in the north, and my sister, my daughter lives in Carmel. She describes what's going on over there. My daughter has no TV, no radio. I mean, she has a radio, but she, she has no access to the outside world. And she can't understand why there's so much anxiety with her children. Because they hear the thing yeah, they, every day. They hear the things going off all the time because they're right up there near the border. So the fact that we're sitting here in Hollywood don't think it's not, it doesn't talk to us. It talks to us as well. Because you don't know what's going to be tomorrow. So number one, the soldiers. Number two is to dive for, for our people everywhere. Number three, and this is so important. Ask a Kurdish Baruch, and I'm quoting my other Rebbe, Rosh Volva. He said this after 1973. 1973, there was a Ruach Mimaro. Hashem opened up the vaults of Shefa that people started to think. And it cannot be that Kla Yisrael does not have an awakening to tshuva to realize that Sahal is invincible with Hashem. Sahal is, is invincible as the stories in Tanakh. Our, our boys can do, 
can just, they're invincible, like we saw in 1967. Without a we saw what happened in, 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 in on, on, on Simchas Terra. Simchas Terra, it's not by chance, but now we're not going to talk about that now. So Kashbaruch is busy cooking things. He's busy trying to bring the goal, but you and I have to be on the front lines, the spiritual front lines, to take this Achrayis. Now let's talk about the month of Adar. Because I'm hoping that this time next month, when we have Pesach and Seder night, it's going to be with the Melech HaMashiach. But this is not a regular Adar. This is Adar Sheni. I'm not going to explain to you right now. But anyone that knows, I'm talking about Kabbalah for dummies, Kabbalah 101. The Iber, right, which means the realignment of the sun and the moon. The sun is the world of Teva. The moon is the world of Lamayla Minat Teva. It's beyond. When they come together, there's always Geula. This is Adar on steroids. This is Venafahu on steroids. Let's talk about Homon. The Gemara Megillah says that the Adam in this Pasuk is referring to Homon. Homon was not a king like Achashverosh. Achashverosh, literally, according to one opinion, he was worse than Homon. But Achashverosh is in the same creed, the same build as Nebuchadnezzar, right? The same as, as the Romans. Yavan is different. Let's leave that out for a moment. It's a different discussion. But the same as the Crusades and the same as the Inquisition and the same as the Nazis. All the same. But Homon, Homon's a genius in evil. He's an Adam. He is the fake Adam, but he understands that the way to get Kla Yisrael is to break up their Achtas and to make them assimilate into the secular world. I, I've literally taken up too much of your time. But you read the stories of the Megillah. Read the Midrashim. You know, every matter you find, you see the Homo is a genius in anti-Semitism. He tells Achashverosh, you know what? Invite all the Jews to the pseudo. Make it glock kosher. Make it so glock kosher. Make the chickens have like payas on them. <laughs> Everything. Get in the best hechsher. But make sure that the waitresses are theistically challenged and not Jewish. Okay. You want a Kodesh Baruch to turn against them? This is it. He's not working with Malchus. He's working with the Kayach of Adam. This is why he's such a bitter enemy. But now I can finally wrap this up. Because how does the Purim story end? Everything can flip around. Meaning that what we're going through now, which is Kasha Mikulam, is like a seed rotting in the ground. It's going worse and worse, and every day is worse than that. But we're going to find out that everything that's happening now, and we are witnessing it, is a Kosh Baruch who is planting the seeds of the Gula, and from that is going to come an explosion. And with this I end, as a tefillah, an explosion of Asher Yishu to Hema, Yisrael Hema B'Seinayim, and all the evil will become a source and will become the seed that allows the explosion of the beautiful Paris of and all that I can say is Kainti Alanu. We should all be Zoku to see this Meher via Mainu. Thank you for listening. Sorry, so emotional, but okay. Uh, questions? Okay. Stop here.